Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you very much uh, for joining this morning's panel session on making it smarter, using technology to rethink the capabilities of UK manufacturing uh, in partnership with Vodafone UK. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Will Tanner. I am the director of the Think Tank Onward, and we are a uh, relatively new centre-right think tank focused on boosting economic opportunity and strengthening the social fabric of communities uh, up and down the UK, and especially in those places where opportunity and social fabric have been in scarce supply over the last few decades. Um, and rethinking manufacturing is at the heart of a lot of our work, particularly around levelling up. Um, because while it is true that the UK has deindustrialized um, more than any other G7 country over the last few decades, um, it is also true that manufacturing delivers much higher levels of productivity growth, uh, higher levels of earnings than other sectors. And that's particularly true in poorer places. Um, so we did a report uh, making a comeback last year that found that between 1979 and 2019, output per job grew nearly twice as fast in manufacturing as it did uh, for the economy as a whole. Uh, productivity in manufacturing is higher in poorer parts of the UK, around 40% of the productivity growth in places like the West Midlands, Wales and the Northwest has come from manufacturing over the last two decades. Uh, and manufacturing also delivers a consistent wage premium uh, of over £1 an hour for the UK as a whole, but rising to about £2 an hour in places like the Northwest. Um, so if levelling up is about anything, um, it should be uh, at least partly about uh, using manufacturing to boost productivity and wages in poorer places. The question is, I guess, how to do that. And that's what we're here to discuss this morning. Um, and I think it is clear from all of the evidence that technological change offers uh, an extraordinary opportunity to transform manufacturing um, and, uh, and, and to bring uh, productivity and, and higher wages uh, to different places. The modern factory floor is very different uh, from the past, much more determined by a kind of complex system of, of digital uh, operations as it, as it is by kind of machiners and packers and foremen of the past. Um, and the advent of new technology like 5G, AI um, and the like, which I'm sure our panel will get into, bring potential uh, kind of huge potential advantages um, uh, through automation, smarter supply chains, more seamless distribution, um, lots and lots of uh, potential gains to be made. Um, and it's also true that things like cloud computing and big data um, offer opportunities to improve efficiency, reduce carbon emissions, um, spot issues as they arise in, in much quicker, quicker detail too. So um, today we're going to get into all of that um, and discuss really how best to harness some of those technological developments that we've seen in lots of other parts of our economy over the last few years um, for the manufacturing sector. Um, and in doing so, uh, make firms more innovative and bring good jobs to, uh, to places that need good jobs. Um, and I'm really, really delighted to be welcoming uh, a brilliant panel um, to help us do just that. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Chris Philp, MP. Um, he's Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at DCMS uh, with responsibility for the digital economy, tech policy um, and a variety of other things. And I should make clear that Chris is speaking very much from his current brief. Um, so talking about uh, the digital economy more broadly uh, with reference to manufacturing, but I'm conscious that other ministers have direct responsibility for the manufacturing sector. And I don't want to compromise him by asking him to talk too much about, about their briefs. Um, our second speaker is going to be Margot James. Um, she is executive chair uh, for the University of Warwick's manufacturing group, um, WMG, um, and is a former minister herself in both DCMS and Bayes, the business department. Um, our third speaker is going to be Nick Blidden, um, UK business director for Vodafone, um, has worked with Vodafone in a variety of roles um, uh, for a number of years. Um, and uh, fourthly, we're going to come to Verity uh, Davidge, who's the Director of Policy at Make UK. Um, she was previously uh, Make UK's lead on skills policy, so understands this from a kind of education and skills perspective, as well as a kind of broader manufacturing perspective. Uh, and before that was at the London Chamber of Commerce. So a completely brilliant uh, panel to discuss a vital issue. Um, we only have an hour, so I'm going to broadly shut up now and I'm going to hand over to our first speaker to give uh, the first set of remarks which should be about five minutes for each of our speakers um, and the minister is going to have to dash off at about half past so I'm going to uh, when we open up q and I'm going to direct questions first and foremost at him so that we can 
kind of use his time as efficiently as possible. So if people do have Q and A, if they do have uh, uh, kind of questions as people are speaking, please do put them in the Q and A function or the chat function at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll get to those first. So if you want to ask the minister, get in quick is what I would say. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Chris Phil. Chris. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction. And thank you to Onward for organising this event and for all the fantastic work you do more broadly, which is enormously appreciated, I know, across government and by Number 10 as well. Look, I want to start by saying that uh, for the government, uh, starting at Number 10, the Treasury, DCMS, Bays, the whole of government, uh, tech is a top priority. Uh, it's the Prime Minister's uh, personal ambition and determination to make sure that the United Kingdom is a uh, technology and science superpower. And to that end, he's convening meetings of a new uh, National Science and Technology Council, which he is personally chairing to drive forward work across government and across the economy on this topic. And the reasons why the government is so uh, firmly behind uh, tech in general uh, are some of the reasons that Will touched on in his introduction. Uh, we see tech as fun foundational and fundamental to the future of our economy. Uh, in particular, uh, its role in solving the decades-long productivity challenge that we've had in this country. Uh, we see the deployment, the development and then deployment of tech as an enormous uh, sort of uh, part of the solution to making sure our productivity, which has somewhat stagnated per hour worked, start growing again, which of course leads also to job creation, um, as Will says, but critically, Jobs that are in the tech sector tend to have substantially higher salaries. The average job outside of tech has an average median salary around 26, 27,000 pounds a year. In the tech sector, it is over 40,000 pounds a year. So a substantial premium. Um, and, and those jobs um, are getting created at a very rapid rate indeed. We also see uh, excellence in tech as, as a national strategic advantage. It's an area where the UK uh, leads the world in many areas uh, and, and leads Europe in almost every area of tech, and that is something we are determined to build on and continue. And um, we see manufacturing as a critical part of that uh, for all the reasons that apply to tech in general, but then there are some additional uh, reasons that apply to manufacturing, one of which is ensuring um, resilience, particularly supply chain resilience, particularly in times of disruption. We've seen significant disruption uh, during COVID, particularly the early parts of COVID, um, but you can imagine other forms of disruption um, that might also cause supply chain issues. And the more that we can manufacture critical things in the United Kingdom rather than the other side of the world, clearly that is better from a, the point of view of supply chain resilience for critical uh, items. We've clearly seen, again, in my portfolio, uh, issues with semiconductor supply chain resilience recently. It's an area we're looking at very actively. We're looking to bring forward a semiconductor strategy shortly. But that's a good illustration of where uh, global supply chains get stressed. Uh, if you have uh, you know, non-local manufacturing, it can have significant consequentials. In the case of semiconductor supply chain issues, um, it's had a consequential impact on the automotive manufacturing industry. That's a good example of, I think, um, why having some domestic capacity is important in critical, in critical areas. There's also obviously uh, an impact on, on net zero if you're able to do more uh, locally and, and with these new uh, digital manufacturing techniques that are, that are coming forward, highly customizable, um, highly flexible, it makes those sort of things easier than they have been in the past. And that's why uh, the government, and I should uh, pay tribute to Bayes, it's a Bayes lead, as Will said, uh, has put £150 million of government money behind the Made Smarter initiative that has been, I think, matched, roughly speaking, by industry making £300 million in total to try and drive progress uh, in this area. Look, I think we can be very proud of the success the UK has achieved in the tech arena. Uh, the year 2021, last year, uh, UK tech businesses raised £29.4 billion of private capital, a phenomenal achievement. Uh, and it, it was by far the highest figure in Europe. Uh, the second country was Germany. Uh, they only raised about half the amount we did. It was about 15 billion and languishing in a distant third place were the French on well under 10 billion. As far as I can see, the French's tech strategy currently centers on trying to unload some uh, obsolete submarine technology that's become suddenly and unexpectedly um, available. So we are leading Europe by far. In terms of unicorns, uh, private tech companies with a billion pound plus valuation, uh, we have more unicorns now than France, Germany, 
and Israel combined. The only countries in the world with more unicorns than us are the Chinese and the Americans. So we're a clear third. And in fact, last year, we created new British unicorns at the phenomenal rate of one every 13 days. And you think about that for a second, having a new billion dollar company every 13 days is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary accomplishment. And in many leading edge areas, uh, we are leading, the, well, certainly leading Europe and in some areas leading the world. AI is an area where which we are particularly uh, focusing on. We published an AI strategy. Um, we're looking to invest a lot of money uh, in that area. Quantum computing is another. We've got a semiconductor strategy coming as well, which will include looking at some areas of semiconductor manufacturing where we have a clear strategic advantage, compound semiconductors being an example. We have a massive uh, lead on uh, chip design uh, design as well. So we're looking to, to double down and reinforce uh, the work we're doing in the areas where we lead. FinTech is another example. We lead the world in FinTech. Um, so we'll, there, there are sort of three areas where the government wants to push in tech, including manufacturing. Uh, and we think there are, there are three things you need, essentially, to create a successful tech ecosystem. And if you fuse those three things together, then you have an explosion of innovation and growth. And those three things are ideas, people, and investment. Um, and I'm conscious of time, so I don't want to spend too much time on each of those. But on the idea for ideas front, we're investing heavily in research and development. The R&D budget uh, is going up from 15 billion a year to about 22 billion a year, so a 50% increase in the coming uh, two or three years. That's going to have a huge impact. We've expanded R&D tax credits to include data acquisition and cloud compute. Very important for a whole number of uh, parts of the tech, the tech ecosystem. And um, specifically in manufacturing, we're also investing. 53 million in five new research centers, university-based research centers to drive forward manufacturing innovation uh, in me medicines, uh, for example, at Strathclyde, Cambridge and Loughborough, um, collaborative industrial robotics uh, at Loughborough, Strathclyde, Cranfield, Bristol and Warwick, uh, connected factories at Nottingham, Cambridge and Sheffield, uh, materials made smarter at Sheffield, Cambridge and Loughborough, Loughborough is doing well here, and people-led digitization uh, in Bath, Nottingham, and once again, Loughborough. So heavy investment on the idea side. On the people side, we, we're introducing new visa routes to make sure people with high levels of skill can get into the UK uh, very quickly and very easily. There's a new scale-up visa uh, coming into effect in a couple of months' time. If a company is growing at more than 20% a year, which for tech businesses is a laughably low hurdle, uh, people being paid more than 33,000 can come in very quickly sort of almost not quite no questions asked but very very quickly very easily that's important we're investing in skills domestically there's a pm uh, digital and technical skills stock take currently ongoing we're going to be publishing that in the coming months and um, we're investing in phds as well for example a thousand phds in artificial intelligence on the investment side the third the third ingredient besides ideas and people we need investment um the eis and seis schemes i think are very successful and encouraging uh, seed funding at the very early stage. Um, I am lobbying colleagues in Treasury uh, to expand the scope of those schemes further. Our VC ecosystem, sort of Series A, Series B, is uh, pretty vibrant. Uh, firms like Balderson are doing very well. There is, however, I would say a gap uh, for scale-up capital, which is particularly relevant for manufacturing. Um, so by that, I mean Series C, Series D, pre-IPO scale-up rounds, sort of 50 to 300 million, where um, because UK financial institutions, particularly pension funds, are under allocated to pre-IPO tech and VCs compared to their North American cousins, we don't have domestic UK VCs that invest for those scale-up rounds. Now you might say, and then they're done instead by West Coast VCs like Sequoia, or indeed by North American pension funds directly like OMAs, or by Sovereign Wealth. Um, you might say, well, does it matter because the rounds are getting done? I say it does matter for three reasons. Firstly, we don't have, therefore, the ecosystem that sits around those very large VCs. Um, secondly, it means when it comes to IPOs, uh, West Coast VCs will push firms to IPO on NASDAQ rather than LSE. And thirdly, UK pension funds who are under allocated to this sector are missing out on a returns opportunity. So we're doing work across government to change some regulations like the fee cap and, and other work to try and get UK pension funds allocating more to this sector, which would benefit manufacturing, where the sums of money involved to scale up are obviously uh, typically very large, measured measured in the in the sort of hundreds of millions rather than tens of millions. Um, and just finally, on the funding point, the investment point, um, IPOs. We had a good year on on the London Stock Exchange last year with some phenomenal tech floats like Dark Trace 
and like Oxford, Nanopore um, and, and others, um, we, we're, we're changing, we have in fact changed the rules already um, to make tech listings uh, more even more attractive. Uh, we can now have a dual uh, share class so founders can retain control and the free float requirements been cut from 25 to 10%. Um, the Treasury are consulting on some prospectus rule changes and we've changed the rules around SPACs, uh, special purpose acquisition companies. A lot of UK tech firms were using SPACs in New York and Amsterdam. Uh, we, they can now do them in the UK more easily and the first one floated um, just before Christmas. So we're determined to make sure the LSE uh, doubles down on its track record and tech firms, manufacturing firms using tech um, list in London rather than in New York. Uh, and we're confident that will, that will happen even more in the coming year than it did last year. Um, but critically, ideas, people, investment, if you bring those together, innovation and growth will follow. Um, so that was a very, very quick canter through, Will, um, what we're up to across the piece. We're determined to, 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 to make the UK a global superpower in science and tech. And whatever we can do to clear obstacles from the runway, we will do that to make sure UK firms can, can get established, can grow, can flourish and succeed. It's in the national interest. It's in the interest of the whole, the whole country. And uh, we're determined to, to make it happen. Back well, over to you, Will. Chris, thank you so much for that um, that fantastically detailed and uh, an incredibly exciting um, set of remarks. I mean, it really does speak to just how much is going on in this space and what an amazing position the UK has if it if it can uh, harness these technologies and and support firms, as you say, to to get started, to grow um, and and to scale uh, to a global um, to a global scale. So fantastic! That's a brilliant way for us to kick off the discussion. Um, Margot, can I now turn to you um, uh, as someone who's been in government, but also now on the outside helping businesses and doing lots of research with WMG and others? Um, uh, really interested in your thoughts on on what we need to do to to really take advantage of that opportunity that Chris outlined. Well thank you very much Will um, and also Onward for organising this event and all the work uh, that you're doing Will at Onward and of course to your sponsors today uh, Vodafone um, a brilliant uh, British success story and, and thank you Chris for your inspiring remarks um, it's it's really great actually when you when you dwell on how successful Britain is as a tech country. And I was going to start just by amplifying a few of those points myself, uh, because if you think about the structural strengths in the UK economy, there's so much to be optimistic about when it comes to digital technology. Chris mentioned the um, record venture capital that is attracted to the UK, with the UK securing more uh, venture capital in tech than France and Germany combined, way out in front of all European markets. And we've got this excellent climate for investment in innovation, um, as well with the super deduction for capital expenditure and the significant increase in R&D support, which Chris mentioned from government. Um, the UK is a, a magnet for global R&D, with a sixth of our UK R&D investment being sourced from um, inward investment from abroad. And we've also got an outstanding STEM education sector as well as research. And at my institution, WMG, uh, we divide roughly 60% research, 40% education, producing 14% of the world's highly cited academic publications in STEM subjects. So whether you're thinking about AI for smart factories, connected transport, sustainable technology of, or life sciences, these strengths all have the potential to be transformative, helping manufacturing businesses start, grow and export. Yet too often, all this acclaimed innovation doesn't translate enough to businesses on the ground. And this isn't a new problem. Um, if you look back through history, so many British innovations have resulted in more jobs being generated abroad than in this country. From John Goodenough's work, original work on lithium ion batteries, to George Gray at the University of Hull, developing the technology behind liquid crystal displays, British innovations too often have been exploited elsewhere with the jobs and revenue from the manufacturing generated by British science too often migrating abroad. Instead, we need a virtuous circle where digital innovation supports business growth in manufacturing here in the UK, which in turn then supports more innovation. Um, so a few points on how I think we should do this. 
I think we, we should expand and simplify the support for SMEs to deploy appropriate technology and digitize. And the government's innovation strategy states that just adopting common technologies that have been in use for some time can improve productivity by between seven and 18%. And we've got a great example, the company that we've been helping, Billingham Bags, who make premium canvas bags, not an area that you would normally associate with digital manufacturing. But at WMG, we placed a graduate intern with them to deploy cobotics in joining, which both accelerated production dramatically and allowed them to innovate in their existing product range and develop new products. So we need more of these simple steps. We've seen the impact of Made Smarter, which Chris mentioned, in the Northwest, and it's fantastic to see that the government is continuing to invest in Made Smarter. We are one of the universities, WMG, that have been appointed to deploy the Made Smarter program around the West Midlands to bolt on to a program we've been running for the last three years called Digital for Manufacturing. And we've helped over 4,000 Midlands-based SMEs in those three years to digitize and automate their processes. Um, to support this, I think digital innovation hubs with control over digital innovation funding could be a single point of contact for businesses regionally, helping them to start or accelerate their digital journey. Um, Chris mentioned people, skills, particularly at technician level. The government's own analysis says that there are over 200,000 data jobs to be filled today. And 46% of firms struggle to recruit people with data skills. So no wonder the National Audit Office states that there's an acute shortage of technician level STEM skills here in the UK. So we need to focus on technical digital skills, particularly at levels four and five and above. Um, and the li lifelong loan entitlement that has just come in to deliver in-work education can be used to support the advancement of digital skills. At WMG, we are working with businesses like Dyson, JLR, Royal Mail and Amazon on their in-work learning programmes. And we're offering modular courses, degree apprenticeships, and we've got over a thousand apprentices now having gone through degree apprenticeships. And we also support two academies for young engineers between the ages of 14 and 19. You can't start, as we all know, too soon in imbuing young people with an enthusiasm to study STEM subjects. Yesterday, we launched a new skills center where we're offering short courses in smart manufacturing, digital twins and industry 4.0 for people in work. And it will be great to be able to integrate those courses into a modular qualification pathway for digital skills. I think it's vital that we use the various um, R&D studies that Bayes have commissioned in, uh, in the last six months, there are three ongoing at the moment, to focus on getting public investment in R&D beyond the Golden Triangle and into the North and the Midlands, um, and indeed Wales. If you look at the UK's manufacturing base, Wales, the Midlands and the North all have high manufacturing intensity, but public R&D spending and digital uptake are significantly higher in London and the South East. The venture capital that we were talking about earlier is such an asset. Um, if you look at the decade leading up to 2019, 76% of total VC investment was in the Golden Triangle. So we need to secure access to that R&D from outside the Golden Triangle. Um, and I think of things like Midlands Future Mobility, where we're working with Vodafone to enable 5G on hundreds of miles of Midlands roads with the aim of making our region a global leader in developing new transport technologies. Um, and just before I finish, I'd like, if I may be very cheeky here, Will, to possibly ask um, as we don't have much time of Chris with us. I would like, I was very interested in, uh, I'm concluding my remarks now, but Chris, I was very interested in what you said about this semiconductor strategy that you're developing. Fantastic. There's only one UK manufacturer left of semiconductors and that manufacturer is um, presently selling to, the, to a Chinese company, to a Chinese investor. Um, and if you'd like more information about that and what we believe we can do um, to prevent that from happening and use instead a British or an American cons consortium, I'd be very interested in briefing your 
office about the status of that single last semiconductor manufacturer based in South Wales. So with that, I will hand back to you, Will, and thank you very much again for the opportunity to share these thoughts with Onward uh, this morning. Thank you. Margaret, thank you so much um, for those remarks. That was fantastic. I, in the interest of um, time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Nick to give his remarks, if that's all right. And then we're going to come back to Chris for two minutes. I think it's probably all we'll be going to be able to um, uh, kind of spare today, but two minutes of his time just to answer that question and perhaps one or two others. Um, so, uh, Nick, if I can have your remarks uh, as um, uh, well, it, it kind of five minutes, five minutes or less. As concisely as possible, will we? I'll, I'll hurry on. But I, I, fantastic for me both to listen to the minister and, and to Margot there. Um, let me change what I was going to say because I think some of the points that you guys have made are, are, are points that I was going to make. Um, so let me just keep very, very simple. Um, I, I think we, we as Vodafone, as, as, a, as a British company, see 5G as genuinely enabling um, uh, opportunity for us and also for us as a society. And I would echo, Margot, your points around the, the, the area. So, you know, we've done a lot of research, as you would expect, 5G spectrum is expensive. You don't make those investments without understanding how you'd get that return. I, I think I would make two points. Firstly, it's very rare that a technology in a telecom sense is, is, is gained for business. And 5G is a business technology, less so from a consumer technology. That's one point. Secondly, the areas you mentioned around Northwest, Northeast, Midlands, Wales, they are areas when we apply our research versus those customers that we think the UK as a UK PLC would get best benefit and best return. Um, I thought I'd bring it to life with two examples. Um, I'm glad I've chosen a, an example in the Midlands, Margot, given, given your comments on, on what we're doing. But let me start with an example in, in, in Ford in Essex. As you know, in Dunmo, Ford have their, their battery manufacturing plant. They've deployed 5G to make that work. Um, I think that's fantastic. I think there's a great case study. They've, they've won awards with us on that. Um, but to give you an example, by deploying 5G as manufacturers, what did they get? Firstly, agility. They can restructure their production lines. They can re-engineer uh, the way they work. So they get agility by deploying 5G. Secondly, you know, when they when they complete a battery weld, it's a thousand welds a minute. It's it's, it's um, five hundred thousand pieces of data, um, and it allows them to get um, data and analytics and data capability. And then thirdly, the big advantage of five G capability is you can slice the network and you can provide a unique private network for 5G to operate. And so for Ford as a manufacturer, they can create that. Now that's one example. It's a great example. It's won awards and, and, and it's available and I can, uh, Will, I'll provide the link where people can look that up. The second example is my favorite example though. And this is an example for Coventry University. Um, and this is an example where they've created augmented reality. So in 5G, we see three areas. We see a digital campus or digital factory, which um, Ford is a good example of. We see connected product, and then we see augmented workers. And in Coventry University, through 5G, they've created a human body, and they've created an immersive experience. So if you're a medical student at Coventry University, you can get inside the body, and we kind of create this opportunity. Now, to create that, the university leveraged ourselves, but also leveraged a, 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 a small, medium-sized enterprise customer or company that, create, that was kind of partly gaming, partly understanding technology, and used their knowledge and 5G technology to create this learning and this experience. And so from a, from a small and medium-sized enterprise perspective, you don't just have to be a manufacturer, you can actually leverage some areas where the UK is fantastic around gaming, around media, and bring some of these things to life, which I think you know, are, are, are part of manufacturing. For me to conclude, I'd want to take a little example from, from my, my time in India, right? So I think if you look at Make in India and you look at some of the things that those guys have done, and it's partly echoing the minister's comments, I think you've got government, you've got industry, you've got technology leadership, and we as Vodafone have to provide that, and you've got academia. And, and maybe, you know, uh, the minister talks about ideas, people and investment. I think I'm saying the same things, maybe slightly different words. The example I would give as, as a technology company, we've created, we call something called Vodafone V-Hub. That's for free learning for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, in the, we launched that 12 months ago. There's been 350,000 
uh, interactions and free learning sessions about how can technology and digital help. Nick, I think we may have lost you just at the end there. Um, but in which so case, I think all three of us we have to come together to create and do that. Thank you very much, Nick. I, I lost you. I don't know about others, but I lost you right at the end there. But I think we got we got all of the main points that you're trying to make. And thank you so much. Now, so, so Chris, it is 11.30. If I could spare you for 30 seconds, would you be able to just um, come back on Margot's question about semiconductor manufacturing, particularly? I mean, obviously, this gets into lots of big geopolitical debates, so I'm not expecting a kind of a very long answer, but also just particularly on how, how manufacturing and digital manufacturing in particular can support leveling up. Those are the two big questions that I was hoping to pose to you. Yeah, well, and so thank you. So to Margot's question, firstly, I mean, the national, the new National Security and Investment Act came into force on the 4th of January, just a few days ago, which gives uh, the government a range of powers where takeovers may interact with national security uh, considerations, which are defined in a variety of ways. Um, I don't want to comment on a lie of, on, on a particular case um, sort of in this forum, but I, I think I know the case that Margot's referring to, and I'd be happy to um, perhaps discuss it with her um, separately, Margot, if your if your mobile phone number is the same as it as it used to be. Um, it is, she's nodding yes. Okay, so let's discuss that um, offline. Um, but we, we are very keen to make sure in areas where the UK does have uh, global leadership, I'm thinking particularly of design and compound semiconductors, that that position of global leadership is is maintained. We don't um, we don't lose our lose our position for a whole number of reasons. Uh, in terms of leveling up, uh, yes, clearly uh, the diffusion of, of of tech and manufacturing, advanced manufacturing around the UK is a critical component of that because you've made the point at the beginning. Uh, set wages tend to be higher, productivity is higher. So we're very committed to doing that. It's a whole range of different measures. I mean, the British Business Bank, the Future Fund, obviously have a UK-wide remit and a focus on the regions. Um, digital skills partnerships that are being rolled out around the country, I think the most recent one was in Hull, uh, are also helping build the relevant uh, skills base. So that it is absolutely a key part of the levelling up agenda, as you say. Well, Minister, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, I'm conscious that we've kept you over time, um, given your, your other constraints. So, so can I just leave it there and just say thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you joining us this morning. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you Vodafone for sponsoring as well. Um, and so, Verity, thank you so much for, for patiently waiting and, and being willing to spend your a few minutes while we um, got those questions in, while we still had uh, Chris with us. Um, can I now come to you? Uh, I'd love to hear more about the work you're doing at Make UK and uh, and your general position on how we can use different technology. Yes, of course, and um, thanks for having me. And um, it's been great to hear all of the insights from the fellow pal panelists so far. I mean, manufacturing is very firmly in my brief, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> stick to uh, what I know and stick to manufacturing and talk a little bit about what we see in terms of where manufacturers are on their digital journey. And I think, you know, the pandemic has definitely accelerated the speed of digital adoption. So Make UK's latest research tells us that in the last 12 months, for example, the, the proportion of companies who are in the revolution phase of digital adoption has gone from 13% last year to 23% this year. And by revolution, we mean that manufacturers are changing the way they derive value and interact with customers and suppliers through digital adoption. Um, and if we compare that figure to 2018, um, not actually that long ago, uh, but that was just 4% of companies in that revolution phase. So in a space of three years, we've gone from 4% to 23%. Um, what's also quite interesting is there's a regional uh, story here too. And given that we've been talking about levelling up, um, I think that's it's really critical uh, that we focus on this because and what our data tends to show is that regions where Made Smarter has been rolled out, and Margot touched upon this earlier, um, manufacturers within those regions are actually more likely to be in the revolution stage. So in the Northwest, for example, far more companies are in that higher end because actually Made Smarter has been embedded within the region for so long. So we've actually seen some real tangible benefits around levelling up um, through digital adoption. 
And what we've also been seeing, which is quite an interesting trend, is the use of digital technologies across the um, entire manufacturing business. So I think we often assume, you know, and actually it is the case that digital adoption is happening within kind of design process, um, manufacturing production, and very much kind of shop floor capabilities. Uh, but more recently, what we've seen is companies utilizing those technologies in HR and payroll, finance and invoicing, and energy management. Uh, the latter, I think, particularly being important given what we're seeing with energy prices right now. So overall, an increasing number of companies of all sizes are now seeing and realizing the benefits of digital adoption. And those companies who have invested in digital adoption uh, generally tell us that they were better able to kind of weather the storm of the pandemic. And, and actually build more kind of long term resilience as well. And I think, again, that's pretty fundamental to um, the leveling up message, you know, with resilience now key to our economic recovery, manufacturers are seeing the advantages of adopting, whether it's AI, automation, robotics and proboscis and additive manufacturing. And just 8% of companies actually now say that they don't see any particular benefits of digital adoption. And of course, when we talk about those benefits, the top kind of benefit or, um, I guess, return on your investment is uh, reduced costs and improved productivity. And because of this benefit, what we see is, or what we're beginning to see is a lag between those companies that have been adopting technology for some time now, moving from that evolution stage to the revolution stage, and those companies who perhaps were in the pre-conception phase, so that's not doing anything, slightly moving into evolution but not fast enough and those tend to be the small and medium-sized companies so what you potentially have and I think we need to be wary of thinking again around leveling up is this productivity gap potentially emerging between those larger companies and the smaller businesses. Um, there's also wider benefits to digital adoption I think very timely around uh, net zero and energy efficiencies so more and more companies now are saying that actually investing in uh, digital technologies and techniques are leading to energy efficiency improvements again importantly given what we're seeing with energy prices right now and also just wider um, net zero ambitions so it's in companies interest now not just to take advantages of these opportunities to meet net zero targets, but also to think about those potential commercial opportunities. Um, of course, for this to happen, um, we need uh, digital connectivity. And when we ask manufacturers uh, in our work around leveling up, um, one in three said that governments should actually prioritize um, investment in 5G. So I think that's really important, again, to make sure that we are touching every region of the economy, um, not just making sure we're hitting kind of London and the southeast. And now these stats, I think, are music to a lot of our ears, but I think it's really important that we don't become complacent. Uh, complacent. Uh, we need to maintain our position um, as a global leader in innovation in this space. And, you know, Margot's points around um, the semiconductor issue, it's one... <laughs> We've heard for many, many months uh, now, and actually we're still waiting for some form of intervention. So we look forward to that strategy, I'm sure, just as much as Marco does. Um, but I think that we also need to begin to address some of the well-known challenges and barriers that we constantly see. Ask any manufacturer a barrier to a topic, the answer is going to probably be one access to skills and one and two access to finance, whatever the barrier, skills and finance. And the same is true here. But we seem to be tinkering a bit around the edges and actually not kind of getting into what we need to see happen. So, you know, we've heard already about the advantages of the Made Smarter scheme. Uh, yes, an additional commitment was made to fund that, but actually we would have liked to see full rollout. We want to level up the whole of the country rolled it out completely. We've proven it's working, keep it going. And then around access to skills, I mean, I could go on a whole other webinar, but we'll wait for um, a Q&A on that one. Again, some great, great government initiatives coming through, lifetime skills guarantee, digital skills boot camps, you know, pension incentives, T-levels boost, all great, all welcome. For me, I think the one thing missing for this agenda is that when we talk about digital transformation and digital skills, we are all going to need some kind of top up, at least, of digital skills in our career. So what we'd really like to see is government explore a lifelong digital skills account. 
which is an employee you could tap into any point of your career. It may be need a top up for your current job or actually if you want to move, retrain um, and into another sector. Um, so I think a lot of potential opportunities that actually digital adoption can deliver. Um, I think that we all agree where the action is needed. It's how we all come together now to make sure that no manufacturer is left behind and indeed no region is left behind either. Thank you. Parity, thank you so much. There was a huge amount in there and it was really, really useful to have some of the data from some of your own research um, about what manufacturers themselves are thinking and, uh, and, and applying different technologies in different ways. Um, so we've got about uh, 20 minutes left. I have a few questions that I was going to abuse my position as chair uh, to pose. And I see that we've we've had at least one question in the Q&A um, and hopefully some more. If, if people would like to ask questions of our panelists, please do pop those questions into the Q&A to make sure they're asked and we make sure that we use the time um, properly. But before perhaps we get into that, um, I wanna pose a question to all of the panelists, um, which is something that a number of you touched on uh, in your remarks, but I think it kind of does get to the heart of, of this issue, which is, um, Larger businesses, especially those that have kind of global footprints that are exposed to lots of different markets, um, uh, are typically much better at applying technology within their within their firms. Um, and the pandemic and the supply chain issues that we've seen over the last few months has clearly been a bit of a shock to the manufacturing sector in terms of forcing lots of these companies to adopt adopt digital uh, ways of working much more intensively. Um, but this, uh, the UK has always had this long tail of. SMEs that are perhaps much less productive um, uh, than, uh, than they could be, um, and certainly less productive than in other countries. And manufacturing is not immune for that. So I guess the kind of question is, what can we do specifically to, to kind of migrate digital ways of working and new technologies down the supply chain to much smaller firms? Um, and whose responsibility is that? Because um, uh, government can do some things and we've got uh, various campaigns from, from government at the moment about improving productivity in small companies, but, um, but often government may not be best placed. And I'd just be interested in, especially, I mean, especially from kind of Margot's perspective, at a university kind of and working through the kind of research and development side Nick's perspective as a kind of large company working on the technology side and Verity you, your role as a kind of a trade body you kind of have three unique perspectives on how to access those SMEs and help them uh, improve their their kind of technological know-how and application so perhaps I could go reverse order so go Verity Nick then Margot if that's okay um, and just just kind of that because that seems to me to be kind of the key question um, uh, at the heart of this debate so Verity first. Um, thanks and I should apologise if you heard my toddler um, join <laughs> the call at the very start of my opening remarks the wonders of working from home I have to band outside my door. Um, I think, you know, I've really touched upon um, funding. I think that's one part of it. And of course, that requires government, but actually, you know, government funding does then leave a private investment. So it is more of a, a two-way you know, two thing. Um, I think for businesses themselves, it's around leadership as well, um, making sure that digital adoption is part of your strategic priority. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and I think for industry, it's sharing best practice. So when we asked companies what would encourage them to accelerate digital adoption, actually they said access to impartial advice, you know, information and guidance on the um, productivity gains, those return on investment. And actually it was, it was more about sharing best practice. And I think that we see a lot of that. And I think or make UK as a trade body, we have a role in bringing together those players to create more peer-to-peer -peer networks. But also those programmes like Made Smarter that do have that mix of kind of funding with advice and guidance are ones that work because it often the case that the challenge-based approach to funding for small businesses doesn't always work. And I think we need to look at that area a bit again. Thank you so much, Verity. Uh, Nick? Yeah, it's, it's, well, look, I think it's a really good question. And so I, I would kind of accept some responsibility and I would accept some leadership responsibility, right? So I think when you say whose responsibility is it? Partly my responsibility, right? I, I have to stand up and we have to lead Vodafone to do that. Um, I, I think 
um, Verity, you make a really good point about skills and finance. I, I think the other thing I see sometimes is, particularly when I'm working with, with, with smaller businesses, is, is risk. Nick, if we deploy this new technology or if we take this new technology, it's, it's new to us. Do we get value from it? Is it going to take us a little bit more time to build that, that capability and that skill set? Um, so, so I think, well, coming back to your question, whose responsibility is it? I, I think we have to take responsibility. I think that there's, a, there's another question around how do you help um, those, those uh, small, medium-sized enterprises get access perhaps to government procurement or government spending? Um, I think partly that's our responsibility as well. Certainly, um, certainly when we're measured by government as a supplier to government, we are measured by how many uh, small and medium-sized enterprises do we work with and how does that flow through? Um, I also think when, when we're deploying or when we're working on new technologies, how much of that can we procure in the UK? And then how much can we also kind of look to leverage? Um, and I'll give you a very simple example, which, which is, it's kind of a manufacturing example, if, if you allow me a little bit of leeway. Um, we've just signed with a company called Proximy for robotic surgery. Uh, and that remote surgery is using 5G and is, is, is creating a digital uh, operating theater. Um, now, that is in some ways manufacturing, right? We, we, are, we have a production run, you have, you have pre-op, you have then, then the operation planning, then you have the logistics of the actual operation itself, then you have others. I think it's our responsibility to also work with other companies to try and make that come together end to end. You know, the investment or, or, the, or the, the joint venture we're doing with approximately is one element of it. There are other areas we need to work and we need to source those customers and companies and go and find them. And if you look up approximately founded by a UK surgeon, Dr. Nadine, I think that's a great example of where you can work with an emerging, innovative, fantastic uh, company. Um, but actually, we need that innovation and that agility, and they need our scale and capability to, to, to be able to deliver that. So, um, you know, I, I accept the responsibility. We do some stuff well. We need to do more. Um, but I think that's a, that's, a, that's a fair challenge. Yeah. Thanks very much, Nick. It's always good when you do these, do these sessions and um, someone puts their hand up and says, yeah, we need, to, we need to do more on that or we need to take responsibility for that. So thank you for doing that. Um, Margot, can I come back, come to you specifically? Mm. Yeah, interested in your thoughts. I mean, not just from WMT, of course, but also your time in government and kind of interested in how we can really help SMEs to, to kind of unleash uh, the power of digital uh, in their operations. Well, I think that we need to do a lot more um, to support smaller companies. And when I say we, I mean the government, I mean the, the large companies um, in the exemplar that Nick has just given um, and the universities. Um, and we, um, the government, I mean, when it works well, I'll give you an example of when it works well, um, we get funding at WMG um, to run one of the high value manufacturing catapults. There are, I think, about eight across the country, and um, we have one. And up the road, just the other side of Coventry, there is another, the Advanced Manufacturing Centre, the AMC. Um, and together, we run these programmes for which we get catapult funding, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, called Digital for Manufacturing, whereby we have some funding to release the very latest research, the latest digital capabilities and automation knowledge that we have into smaller businesses. And critical factor is you mustn't let the criteria for involvement on the part of the SME be too onerous. Um, that they mustn't have to spend loads of time filling out applications and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and it really does work. We've all mentioned Made Smarter um, and that's now been rolled across the West Midlands. It's been up in the Northwest. Um, you, you need to put the right sort of level of investment in. You need to commission people who know what they're doing. And I like to think WMG and also the AMC uh, know what they're doing. And what we're doing now, working with the new CEO of the, of the Catapult, Catherine, um, to get that program that we're running in the Midlands applicable throughout the, the Catapult network so that we will be opening that up to SMEs across the country, not just in the Northwest and the West Midlands. Um, so I think it's programs like that. Another crucial program, of course, um, was facilitated in part by the apprenticeship levy, um, which should be capable of being used by large companies 
down the supply chains. Now, we all know, I'm sure, that that's had a very rocky history, but it now can be used in supply chains and is being used in supply chains. And in, in, in fact, funds quite a lot of the degree apprenticeships that WMG teach, the academic component of, most of they're all in STEM subjects. They all yield a more um, skilled, digitally skilled workforce, which SMEs need. Um, and then I just wanted to pick up the point re related to this actually in, in the Q&A from Malcolm Harbour. Um, Malcolm, hello, I'm sorry, I can't see you, um, but I know Malcolm well. Um, and he raises the point about procurement, that Bayes have a procurement strategy to encourage SMEs be, to be used more by large companies. Um, and it doesn't necessarily translate through. And I think we need to work on that as well um, to, so that the large companies know the government are backing SMEs and, and will hopefully follow that leadership. Thank you very much, Margot. And you're totally right. I was going to come on to Margot, Margot's uh, question. There's much more to be said on that. But uh, I just no, indeed. Corporate procurement is a kind of a fascinating question. The other comment that we have had um, in the chat uh, from Jeffrey Richards, uh, which I think is a very good point, is that the British Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, or British Chambers of Commerce, I should say, including the one that Verity used to work for, um, uh, is an interesting avenue as well for, for training up and, uh, and, and spreading intelligence and information through, through SMEs as well. Um, uh, so let us then come on to uh, that question from Malcolm and I think he's just he's just uh, posed an additional question which I'm going to pose to Verity and uh, Nick given um, Margot's already touched on this um, which is what is the role of government in procurement uh, or procuring uh, SMEs and indeed other manufacturers and using that pull through procurement to drive digital adoption. Um, uh, Malcolm, in addition to his question, has also um, said that he works with the Connected Places Catapult um, and uh, has many innovative SMEs frustrated at access to procurement. So is that is that an area where tangible progress could be made quite quickly? That's something government could change uh, figuratively at the sweep of a pen. So it's kind of relatively fast acting, perhaps. Um, do you agree with that, Nick? And then Verity. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yes and no. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm becoming a politician. Sorry. Let, let me. Um, <laughs> um, yes, because actually, to be fair to government, and 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 you know, we were in the cabinet office review last week. Government hold me to account on a set of metrics about how much uh, work do I do with small, uh, medium-sized enterprises? How do we make that easy? Um, I, I think there's a fair point uh, in Malcolm's question, which is. You know, whilst bears are driving that, is that being adopted across Whitehall? Are there other things that we could do? Could we, as a, as a, uh, could government as a as a whole be more connected and joined up? Probably, yeah. I think that's a fair point. Um, how do you do that? I, I think they have a pretty good accountability process where they hold us us there as a as a major supplier to government. And how are we driving those? And how are those metrics working? Um, I think on things like V Hub, I mentioned that before, but I'll, I'll go again. That's fully self-funded by Vodafone. We use our own money to do that. It's part of our purpose, and we provide that training and that development. What stops it? Sometimes big company processes stop it. You know, credit checking. You know, scale. Putting. You know, Verity mentioned earlier. Putting. Putting a. You know, somebody through a really. Uh, you've got to protect small and medium-sized companies, right? You try and put them through a standard, big multinational procurement process. That can be very expensive before you even get on the on the supply chain list and before you've even got any business, right? So I think you know, can government government have got a good policy? Can they do more? Yes. Can it be more joined up? Yes. What stops it? I think you've got to work, and, and this is something we're trying to work in Vodafone about. How do you give those small and medium-sized enterprise access to your spend without making it too risky or too cost effective? Could you cluster, for example? One of the areas we're looking at is could could you contract independently through a kind of slightly different? Could you cluster that? What are the areas that we could give that? Um, now, 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 some of the things that we're very interested to do on there, and we're very keen to do it, is because we see skill shortages in the area. So we skills, see skill shortages in rolling out fiber. We see skill shortages in five G. We see skill shortages in in actually the engineering resources to build this. Um, and therefore, I think it's in our, in our own interest to try and drive it. Um, but that hopefully that gives you a flavour of what I'm seeing, what might stop it and what we're trying to do about it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. And I'm, co I'm conscious of time, so I suspect we probably won't have time for another round of questions. So Verity, if I could perhaps come to you on this question of, of pull through procurement, but also we've had a question from an anonymous attendee who says, um, uh, advances in productivity um, lead to high quality jobs in, in the areas that we want them and don't just lead to kind of automation or, or offshoring or, or that type of thing. Because technology is, has not historically, well, always been perceived as being uh, the friend of new jobs. In some ways, it's seen as the tech jobs. So kind of interested in your perspective on that. Yeah, well, just on the procurement point, and I think there's a, another um, comment around this as well. I mean, 89% of manufacturers say that actually winning procurement contracts within their region is either somewhat or very difficult. You know, Margot touched upon that kind of their ability to go through various kind of jump through um, <laughs> jump over hurdles and go through um, hoops in order just to try to get a procurement contract which automatically switches them on, off. So I think anything that we can do to make it easier for manufacturers to win public procurement contracts would be very well received by the sector and government kind of mooted a bit of that in its green paper, um, white paper, sorry, towards the end of last year. I think um, procurement could or should maybe consider the resilience of the supply chain um, and identify any capabilities or vulnerabilities within it. Um, you know, procurement for items that are of strategic national importance, I think, should be where possible. Prioritise at least um, or part uh, be resourced within the UK. I think, again, that would be a very positive measure. You know, one of the things that we saw at the end of 2020 was a sudden change in NHS procurement policies, which actually meant that manufacturers who, in response to COVID-19, had adapted their businesses to produce PPE, um, were actually left without contracts and actually their staff sadly faced redundancy. So I think there are changes that we could make here as the government has um, floated, and I think we would like to um, see them take forward. Um, just on the point around digital adoption and, um, I guess, the kind of retraining element, I think there is always that when we talked about 4IR years ago, you know, robots taking over my job, that was always the big concern. Whenever we do research or speak to manufacturers about how they invest in automation, digital adoption and what that means, it doesn't result in job losses. It's the creation of uh, new roles and tasks, not new jobs. It's not new jobs. It's changing those roles and tasks. And actually, for those employees, it's probably the employer putting their hands in their pockets, paying for more training to upskill and retrain them. We never hear of companies say, you know, the next route is redundancy. We hear the next route is to deploy you either within this new role that has been created or in another part of the business. And I think it's really important that when we talk about digital adoption, we're talking about higher level skills, higher level jobs and therefore higher level uh, pay as well. Verity, thank you so much. That's that's a brilliant way to end and um, kind of defying the naysayers and showing that um, that actually this is this is uh, additive rather than detractive. Um, so so fantastic. This has been a really brilliant session, um, and there's been so much rich um, thinking in it. We we will take a huge amount of that into our work at Onward, but I hope everyone who's joined virtually uh, is able to take that away into their different roles and organizations too. Um, there's a huge amount, far too much to kind of sum up, but three things that I'm really, really struck by that I think have come up repeatedly is firstly, just the sheer enormity of the opportunity. Um, and uh, that's kind of catalyzed by the pandemic. I was really struck by some of the data that Verity cited around the number of firms, uh, the kind of big increase in the number in the last year, and particularly over the last three or four years, the number of firms who are using technology in a more revolutionary way than they were before um, that clearly could have a, a massive knock-on impact in terms of productivity wages um, uh, and kind of economic value more generally um, and that value is not just for firms themselves as you just said Verity but it's also for the workers within those firms in terms of retraining upskilling um, kind of new opportunities um, uh, and that, that has to be a huge positive. Um, the second thing is just the, the growing importance of the resilience of the supply chain um, uh, that came up again and again, um, that we need to be talking much more about resilience, uh, much uh, kind of the whole the whole kind of maybe we're moving from kind of just in time supply chains to uh, to something a bit more resilient than that. Um, and certainly the last few months have, have made lots of people think of think rethink the kind of supply chain economy. Um, and then thirdly, it was kind of implicit rather than explicit in this conversation, but 
I'm struck by just the importance of inter, what you might call intermediary bodies, whether they are firms like Vodafone who are providing the technology, working with companies, um, trying to kind of educate and inform um, as well as sell their, their products, um, but also intermediary bodies like WMG, like Mate UK, like British Chamber of Commerce, like the Catapult Centres, um, uh, like the different kind of research uh, centres that were cited through this conversation. It's clear that while government does have a role, actually some of that might be through kind of decentralised or distributed mechanisms that can access far more people and actually have a kind of regional presence in a way that central government perhaps struggles to. Um, so those were the kind of three takeaways I took away from the discussion, um, uh, but there was a lot more besides. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Thank you in particular to our four panellists, including the minister who's not here to hear it. Um, and thank you uh, to Vodafone for helping us put on this fantastic discussion, which uh, I think has been enormously helpful in terms of crystal certainly crystallising my thoughts about a really exciting, but also quite challenging policy area. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>